Section 8 of Eureka, a prose poem by Edgar Allan Poe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In the first place, we may get a general relative conception of the interval referred to by comparing it with the interplanetary spaces. If, for example, we suppose the Earth, which is, in reality, 95 millions of miles from the Sun, to be only one foot from that luminary, then Neptune would be 40 feet distant and the star Alpha Lyra, at the very least, a hundred and fifty-nine. Now, I presume that, in the termination of my last sentence, few of my readers have noticed anything especially objectionable, particularly wrong. I said that the distance of the Earth from the Sun being taken at one foot, the distance of Neptune would be forty feet, and that of Alpha Lyra a hundred and fifty-nine. The proportion between one foot and a hundred and fifty-nine has appeared, perhaps, to convey a sufficiently definite impression of the proportion between the two intervals, that of the earth from the sun, and that of Alpha Lyra from the same luminary. But my account of the matter should, in reality, have run thus. The distance of the earth from the sun being taken at one foot, the distance of Neptune would be forty feet, and that of Alpha Lyra a hundred and fifty-nine miles that is to say i had assigned to alpha lyra in my first statement of the case only five thousand two hundred and eightieth part of that distance which is the least distance possible at which it can actually lie to proceed however distant a mere planet is yet when we look at it through a telescope we see it under a certain form of a certain appreciable size now I have already hinted at the probable bulk of many of the stars, nevertheless, when we view any one of them, even through the most powerful telescope, it is found to present us with no form, and consequently with no magnitude whatever. We see it as a point and nothing more. Again, let us suppose ourselves walking at night on a highway. In a field on one side of the road is a line of tall objects, say trees, the figures of which are distinctly defined against the background of the sky. This line of objects extends at right angles to the road, and from the road to the horizon. Now, as we proceed along the road, we see these objects changing their positions, respectively, in relation to a certain fixed point in that portion of the firmament which forms the background of the view. Let us suppose this fixed point, sufficiently fixed for our purposes, to be the rising moon we become aware at once that while the tree nearest us so far alters its position in respect to the moon as to seem flying behind us the tree in the extreme distance has scarcely changed at all its relative position with the satellite we then go on to perceive that the farther the objects are from us the less they alter their positions and the converse then we begin unwittingly to estimate the distances of individual trees by the degrees in which they evince the relative alteration finally we come to understand how it might be possible to ascertain the actual distance of any given tree in the line by using the amount of relative alteration as a basis in a simple geometrical problem now this relative alteration is what we call parallax and by parallax we calculate the distances of the heavenly bodies. Applying the principle to the trees in question, we should, of course, be very much at a loss to comprehend the distance of that tree, which, however far we proceeded along the road, should evince no parallax at all. This, in the case described, is a thing impossible, but impossible only because all distances on our earth are trivial indeed in comparison with the vast cosmical quantities we may speak of them as absolutely nothing now let us suppose the star alpha lyra directly overhead and let us imagine that instead of standing on the earth we stand at one end of a straight road stretching through space to a distance equaling the diameter of the earth's orbit that is to say to a distance of one hundred ninety millions of miles having observed by means of the most delicate micrometrical instruments the exact position of the star let us now pass along this inconceivable road until we reach its other extremity now once again let us look at the star it is precisely where we left it 
our instruments however delicate assure us that its relative position is absolutely is identically the same as at the commencement of our unutterable journey no parallax none whatever has been found the fact is that in regard to the distance of the fixed stars of any one of the myriads of suns glistening on the farther side of that awful chasm which separates our system from its brothers in the cluster to which it belongs astronomical science until very lately could speak only with a negative certainty assuming the brightest as the nearest we could say even of them only that there is a certain incomprehensible distance on the hither side of which they cannot be how far they are beyond it we had in no case been able to ascertain we perceived for example that alpha lyra cannot be nearer to us than nineteen trillions two hundred billions of miles but for all we knew and indeed for all we now know it may be distant from us in the square or the cube or any other power of the number mentioned by dint however of wonderfully minute and cautious observations continued with novel instruments for many laborious years bezel not long ago deceased has lately succeeded in determining the distance of six or seven stars among others that of the star numbered sixty one in the constellation of the swan the distance in this latter instance ascertained is six hundred and seventy thousand times that of the sun which last it will be remembered is ninety five millions of miles the star sixty one cygni then is nearly sixty four trillions of miles from us or more than three times the distance assigned as the least possible for alpha lyra in attempting to appreciate this interval by the aid of any considerations of velocity as we did in endeavoring to estimate the distance of the moon we must leave out of sight altogether such nothings as the speed of a cannon-ball or of sound light however according to the latest calculations of struve proceeds at the rate of a hundred and sixty seven thousand miles in a second thought itself cannot pass through this interval more speedily if indeed thought can traverse it at all yet in coming from sixty one signi to us even at this inconceivable rate light occupies more than ten years and consequently were the star this moment blotted out from the universe still for ten years would it continue to sparkle on undimmed in its paradoxical glory keeping now in mind whatever feeble conception we may have attained of the interval between our sun and sixty one signi let us remember that this interval however unutterably vast we are permitted to consider as but the average interval among the countless hosts of stars comprising that cluster or nebula to which our system as well as that of sixty one signi belongs i have in fact stated the case with great moderation we have excellent reason for believing sixty one signi to be one of the nearest stars and thus for concluding at least for the present that its distance from us is less than the average distance between star and star in the magnificent cluster of the milky way and here once again and finally it seems proper to suggest that even as yet we have been speaking of trifles ceasing to wonder at the space between star and star in our own or in any particular cluster let us rather turn our thoughts to the intervals between cluster and cluster in the all-comprehensive cluster of the universe i have already said that light proceeds at the rate of a hundred and sixty seven thousand miles in a second that is about ten millions of miles in a minute or about six hundred millions of miles in an hour yet so far removed from us are some of the nebula that even light speeding with this velocity could not and does not reach us from those mysterious regions in less than three millions of years this calculation moreover is made by the elder herschel and in reference merely to those comparatively proximate clusters within the scope of his own telescope there are nebula however which through the magical tube of lord ross are this instant whispering in our ears the secrets of a million of ages bygone in a word the events which we behold now at this moment on those worlds are the identical events which interested their inhabitants 
ten hundred thousand centuries ago in intervals in distances such as this suggestion forces upon the soul rather than upon the mind we find at length a fitting climax to all the hitherto frivolous considerations of quantity our fancies thus occupied with the cosmical distances let us take the opportunity of referring to the difficulty which we have so often experienced while pursuing the beaten path of astronomical reflection in accounting for the immeasurable voids alluded to in comprehending why chasms so totally unoccupied and therefore apparently so needless have been made to intervene between star and star between cluster and cluster in understanding to be brief a sufficient reason for the titanic scale in respect of mere space on which the universe is seen to be constructed a rational cause for the phenomenon i maintain that astronomy has palpably failed to assign but the considerations through which in this essay we have proceeded step by step enable us clearly and immediately to perceive that space and duration are one that the universe might endure throughout an era at all commensurate with the grandeur of its component material portions and with the high majesty of its spiritual purposes it was necessary that the original atomic diffusion be made to so inconceivable an extent as to be only not infinite it was required in a word that the stars should be gathered into visibility from invisible nebulosity proceed from nebulosity to consolidation and so grow gray in giving birth and death to unspeakably numerous and complex variations of vitalic development it was required that the stars should do all this should have time thoroughly to accomplish all these divine purposes during the period in which all things were effecting their return into unity with a velocity accumulating in the inverse proportion of the squares of the distances at which lay the inevitable end throughout all this we have no difficulty in understanding the absolute accuracy of the divine adaptation the density of the stars respectively proceeds of course as their condensation diminishes condensation and heterogeneity keep pace with each other through the latter which is the index of the former we estimate the vitalic and spiritual development thus in the density of the globes we have the measure in which their purposes are fulfilled as density proceeds as the divine intentions are accomplished as less and still less remains to be accomplished so in the same ratio should we expect to find an acceleration of the end and thus the philosophical mind will easily comprehend that the divine designs in constituting the stars advance mathematically to their fulfillment and more it will readily give the advance a mathematical expression it will decide that this advance is inversely proportional with the squares of the distances of all created things from the starting point and goal of their creation not only is this divine adaptation however mathematically accurate but there is that about it which stamps it as divine in distinction from that which is merely the work of human constructiveness i allude to the complete mutuality of adaptation for example in human constructions a particular cause has a particular effect a particular intention brings to pass a particular object but this is all we see no reciprocity the effect does not react upon the cause the intention does not change relations with the object in divine constructions the object is either design or object as we choose to regard it and we may take at any time a cause for an effect or the converse so that we can never absolutely decide which is which to give an instance in polar climates the human frame to maintain its animal heat requires for combustion in the capillary system an abundant supply of highly azotized food such as train oil but again in polar climates nearly the sole food afforded man is the oil of abundant seals and whales now whether is oil at hand because imperatively demanded or the only thing demanded because the only thing to be obtained it is impossible to decide there is an absolute reciprocity of adaptation 
the pleasure which we derive from any display of human ingenuity is in the ratio of the approach to this species of reciprocity in the construction of plot for example in fictitious literature we should aim at so arranging the incidents that we shall not be able to determine of any one of them whether it depends from any one other or upholds it in this sense of course perfection of plot is really or practically unattainable but only because it is a finite intelligence that constructs the plots of god are perfect the universe is a plot of god and now we have reached a point at which the intellect is forced again to struggle against its propensity for analogical inference against its monomaniac grasping at the infinite moons have been seen revolving about planets planets about stars and the poetical instinct of humanity its instinct of the symmetrical if the symmetry be but a symmetry of surface this instinct which the soul not only of man but of all created beings took up in the beginning from the geometrical basis of the universal irradiation impels us to the fancy of an endless extension of this system of cycles closing our eyes equally to deduction and induction we insist upon imagining a revolution of all the orbs of the galaxy about some gigantic globe which we take to be the central pivot of the whole each cluster in the great cluster of clusters is imagined of course to be similarly supplied and constructed while that the analogy may be wanting at no point we go on to conceive these clusters themselves again as revolving about some still more august sphere this latter still again with its encircling clusters as but one of yet more magnificent series of agglomerations gyrating about yet another orb central to them some orb still more unspeakably sublime some orb let us rather say of infinite sublimity endlessly multiplied by the infinitely sublime such are the conditions continued in perpetuity which the voice of what some people term analogy calls upon the fancy to depict and the reason to contemplate if possible without becoming dissatisfied with the picture such in general are the interminable gyrations beyond gyration which we have been instructed by philosophy to comprehend and to account for at least in the best manner we can now and then however a philosopher proper one whose frenzy takes a very determinate turn whose genius to speak more reverentially has a strongly pronounced washerwomanish bias doing everything up by the dozen enables us to see precisely that point out of sight at which the revolutionary processes in question do and of right ought to come to an end it is hardly worth while perhaps even to sneer at the reveries of fourier but much has been said latterly of the hypothesis of maedler that there exists in the centre of the galaxy a stupendous globe about which all the systems of the cluster revolve the period of our own indeed has been stated a hundred and seventeen millions of years that our sun has a motion in space independently of its rotation and revolution about the system's centre of gravity has long been suspected this motion granting it to exist would be manifested perspectively the stars in that firmamental region which we were leaving behind us would in a very long series of years become crowded those in the opposite quarter scattered now by means of astronomical history we ascertain cloudily that some such phenomena have occurred on this ground it has been declared that our system is moving to a point in the heavens diametrically opposite the star zeta herculis but this inference is perhaps the maximum to which we have any logical right maedler however has gone so far as to designate a particular star alcyone in the pleiades as being at or about the very spot around which a general revolution is performed now since by analogy we are led in the first instance to these dreams it is no more than proper that we should abide by analogy at least in some measure during their development and that analogy which suggests the revolution suggests at the same time a central orb about which it should be performed 
so far the astronomer was consistent the central orb however should dynamically be greater than all the orbs taken together which surround it of these there are about a hundred millions why then it was of course demanded do we not see this vast central sun at least equal in mass to one hundred millions of such suns as ours why do we not see it we especially who occupy the mid region of the cluster the very locality near which at all events must be situated this incomparable star the reply was ready it must be non-luminous as are our planets here then to suit a purpose analogy is suddenly let fall not so it may be said we know that non-luminous suns actually exist it is true that we have reason at least for supposing so but we have certainly no reason whatever for supposing that the non-luminous suns in question are encircled by luminous suns while these again are surrounded by non-luminous planets and it is precisely all this with which maedler is called upon to find anything analogous in the heavens for it is precisely all this which he imagines in the case of the galaxy admitting the thing to be so we cannot help here picturing to ourselves how sad a puzzle the why it is so must prove to all the a priori philosophers but granting in the very teeth of analogy and of everything else the non-luminosity of the vast central orb we may still inquire how this orb so enormous could fail of being rendered visible by the flood of light thrown upon it from the hundred millions of glorious suns glaring in all directions about it upon the urging of this question the idea of an actually solid central sun appears in some measure to have been abandoned and speculation proceeded to assert that the systems of the cluster perform their revolutions merely about an immaterial centre of gravity common to all here again then to suit a purpose analogy is let fall the planets of our system revolve it is true about a common centre of gravity but they do this in connection with and in consequence of a material sun whose mass more than counterbalances the rest of the system the mathematical circle is a curve composed of infinity of straight lines but this idea of the circle an idea which in view of all ordinary geometry is merely the mathematical as contradistinguished from the practical idea is in sober fact the practical conception which alone we have any right to entertain in regard to the majestic circle with which we have to deal at least in fancy when we suppose our system revolving about a point in the centre of the galaxy let the most vigorous of human imaginations attempt but to take a single step toward the comprehension of a sweep so ineffable it would be scarcely paradoxical to say that a flash of lightning itself travelling forever upon the circumference of this unutterable circle would still forever be travelling in a straight line that the path of our sun in such an orbit would to any human perception deviate in the slightest degree from a straight line even in a million of years as a proposition not to be entertained yet we are required to believe that a curvature has become apparent during the brief period of our astronomical history during a mere point during the utter nothingness of two or three thousand years it may be said that maedler has really entertained a curvature in the direction of our system's now well-established progress through space admitting if necessary this fact to be in reality such i maintain that nothing is thereby shown except the reality of this fact the fact of a curvature for its thorough determination ages will be required and when determined it will be found indicative of some binary or other multiple relation between our sun and some one or more of the proximate stars i hazard nothing however in predicting that after the lapse of many centuries all efforts at determining the path of our sun through space will be abandoned as fruitless this is easily conceivable when we look at the infinity of perturbation it must experience 
from its perpetually shifting relations with other orbs in the common approach of all to the nucleus of the galaxy but in examining other nebula than that of the milky way in surveying generally the clusters which overspread the heavens do we or do we not find confirmation of Maedler's hypothesis we do not the forms of the clusters are exceedingly diverse when casually viewed but on close inspection through powerful telescopes we recognize the sphere very distinctly as at least the proximate form of all their constitution in general being at variance with the idea of revolution about a common center it is difficult says sir john herschel to form any conception of the dynamical state of such systems on one hand without a rotary motion and a centrifugal force it is hardly possible not to regard them as in a state of progressive collapse on the other granting such a motion and such a force we find it no less difficult to reconcile their forms with the rotation of the whole system meaning cluster around any single axis without which internal collision would appear to be inevitable some remarks lately made about the nebula by dr nickel in taking quite a different view of the cosmical conditions from any taken in this discourse have a very peculiar applicability to the point now at issue he says when our greatest telescopes are brought to bear upon them we find that those which were thought to be irregular are not so they approach nearer to a globe here is one that looked oval but lord ross's telescope brought it into a circle now there occurs a very remarkable circumstance in reference to these comparatively sweeping circular masses of nebula we find they are not entirely circular but the reverse and that all around them on every side there are volumes of stars stretching out apparently as if they were rushing towards a great central mass in consequence of the action of some great power were i to describe in my own words what must necessarily be the existing condition of each nebula on the hypothesis that all matter is as i suggest now returning to its original unity i should simply be going over nearly verbatim the language here employed by dr nickel without the faintest suspicion of that stupendous truth which is the key to the nebular phenomena and here let me fortify my position still farther by the voice of a greater than maedler of one moreover to whom all the data of maedler have long been familiar things carefully and thoroughly considered referring to the elaborate calculations of argelander the very researches which form maedler's basis humboldt whose generalizing powers have never perhaps been equalled has the following observation when we regard the real proper or non-perspective motions of the stars we find many groups of them moving in opposite directions and the data as yet in hand render it not necessarily at least to conceive that the systems composing the milky way or the clusters generally composing the universe are revolving about any particular center unknown whether luminous or non-luminous it is but man's longing for a fundamental first cause that impels both his intellect and his fancy to the adoption of such an hypothesis the phenomenon here alluded to that of many groups moving in opposite directions is quite inexplicable by maedler's idea but arises as a necessary consequence from that which forms the basis of this discourse while the merely general direction of each atom of each moon planet star or cluster would on my hypothesis be of course absolutely rectilinear while the general path of all bodies would be a right line leading to the center of all it is clear nevertheless that this general rectilinearity would be compounded of what with scarcely any exaggeration we may term an infinity of particular curves an infinity of local deviations from rectilinearity the result of continuous differences of relative position among the multitudinous masses as each proceeded on its own proper journey to the end i quoted just now from sir john herschel the following words used in reference to the clusters on one hand without any rotary motion and a centrifugal force it is hardly possible not to regard them as in a state of progressive collapse 
the fact is that in surveying the nebula with a telescope of high power we shall find it quite impossible having once conceived this idea of collapse not to gather at all points corroboration of the idea a nucleus is always apparent in the direction of which the stars seem to be precipitating themselves nor can these nuclei be mistaken for merely perspective phenomena the clusters are really denser near the center sparser in the regions more remote from it in a word we see everything as we should see it were a collapse taking place but in general it may be said of these clusters that we can fairly entertain while looking at them the idea of orbital movement about a center only by admitting the possible existence in the distant domains of space of dynamical laws with which we are unacquainted on the part of herschel however there is evidently a reluctance to regard the nebula as in a state of progressive collapse but if facts even if appearances justify the supposition of their being in this state why it may well be demanded is he disinclined to admit it simply on account of a prejudice merely because the supposition is at war with a preconceived and utterly baseless notion that of the endlessness that of the eternal stability of the universe end of section eight section nine of eureka a prose poem by edgar allan poe this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. If the propositions of this discourse are tenable, the state of progressive collapse is precisely that state in which alone we are warranted in considering all things. And with due humility, let me here confess that, for my part, I am at a loss to conceive how any other understanding of the existing condition of affairs could ever have made its way into the human brain the tendency to collapse and the attraction of gravitation are convertible phrases and using either we speak of the reaction of the first act never was necessity less obvious than that of supposing matter imbued with an ineradicable quality forming part of its material nature a quality or instinct forever inseparable from it and by dint of which inalienable principle every atom is perpetually impelled to seek its fellow atom never was necessity less obvious than that of entertaining this unphilosophical idea going boldly behind the vulgar thought we have to conceive metaphysically that the gravitating principle appertains to matter temporarily only while diffused only while existing as many instead of as one appertains to it by virtue of its state of irradiation alone appertains in a word altogether to its condition and not in the slightest degree to itself in this view when the irradiation shall have returned into its source when the reaction shall be completed the gravitating principle will no longer exist and in fact astronomers without at any time reaching the idea here suggested seem to have been approximating it in the assertion that if there were but one body in the universe it would be impossible to understand how the principle gravity could obtain that is to say from a consideration of matter as they find it they reach a conclusion at which i deductively arrive that so pregnant a suggestion as the one just quoted should have been permitted to remain so long unfruitful is nevertheless a mystery which i find it difficult to fathom it is perhaps in no little degree however our propensity for the continuous for the analogical in the present case more particularly for the symmetrical which has been leading us astray and in fact the sense of the symmetrical is an instinct which may be depended upon with an almost blindfold reliance it is the poetical essence of the universe of the universe which in the supremeness of its symmetry is but the most sublime of poems now symmetry and consistency are convertible terms thus poetry and truth are one a thing is consistent in the ratio of its truth true in the ratio of its consistency a perfect consistency i repeat 
can be nothing but an absolute truth. We may take it for granted, then, that man cannot long or widely err if he suffer himself to be guided by his poetical, which I have maintained to be his truthful, in being his symmetrical instinct. He must have a care, however, lest in pursuing too heedlessly the superficial symmetry of forms and motions, he leave out of sight the really essential symmetry of the principles which determine and control them. That the stellar bodies would finally be merged in one, that at last all would be drawn into the substance of one stupendous central orb already existing, is an idea which, for some time past, seems vaguely and indeterminately to have held possession of the fancy of mankind. It is an idea, in fact, which belongs to the class of the excessively obvious. It springs instantly from a superficial observation of the cyclic and seemingly gyrating or vorticial movements of those individual portions of the universe which come most immediately and most closely under our observation. There is not, perhaps, a human being of ordinary education and of average reflective capacity to whom at some period the fancy in question has not occurred, as if spontaneously or intuitively, and wearing all the character of a very profound and very original conception. This conception, however, so commonly entertained, has never, within my knowledge, arisen out of any abstract considerations. Being, on the contrary, always suggested, as I say, by the vorticial movements about centers, a reason for it also, a cause for the ingathering of all the orbs into one, imagined to be already existing, was naturally sought in the same direction, among these cyclic movements themselves. Thus it happened that, on announcement of the gradual and perfectly regular decrease observed in the orbit of Encke's comet, at every successive revolution about our sun, astronomers were nearly unanimous in the opinion that the cause in question was found, that a principle was discovered sufficient to account physically for that final universal agglomeration which, I repeat, the analogical, symmetrical, or poetical instinct of man had predetermined to understand as something more than a simple hypothesis. This cause, this sufficient reason for the final ingathering, was declared to exist in an exceedingly rare but still material medium pervading space, which medium, by retarding in some degree the progress of the comet, perpetually weakened its tangential force, thus giving a predominance to the centripetal, which, of course, drew the comet nearer and nearer at each revolution, and would eventually precipitate it upon the sun. All this was strictly logical, admitting the medium or ether, but this ether was assumed most illogically on the ground that no other mode than the one spoken of could be discovered of accounting for the observed decrease in the orbit of the comet. As if from the fact that we could discover no other mode of accounting for it, it followed, in any respect, that no other mode of accounting for it existed. It is clear that innumerable causes might operate in combination to diminish the orbit, without even a possibility of our ever becoming acquainted with one of them. In the meantime, it has never been fairly shown, perhaps, why the retardation occasioned by the skirts of the sun's atmosphere, through which the comet passes at perihelion, is not enough to account for the phenomenon. That Encke's comet will be absorbed into the sun is probable that all the comets of the system will be absorbed is more than merely possible but in such case the principle of absorption must be referred to eccentricity of orbit to the close approximation to the sun of the comets at their perihelia and is a principle not affecting in any degree the ponderous spheres which are to be regarded as the true material constituents of the universe touching comets in general let me here suggest in passing that we cannot be far wrong in looking upon them as the lightning flashes of the cosmical heaven. The idea of retarding ether and, through it, of a final agglomeration of all things, seemed at one time, however, to be confirmed by the observation of a positive decrease in the orbit of the solid moon.' 
by reference to eclipses recorded 2,500 years ago, it was found that the velocity of the satellite's revolution then was considerably less than it is now. That on the hypothesis that its motions in its orbit is uniformly in accordance with Kepler's law, and was accurately determined then, 2,500 years ago, it is now in advance of the position it should occupy by nearly 9,000 miles. The increase of velocity proved, of course, a diminution of orbit, and astronomers were fast yielding to a belief in an ether as the sole mode of accounting for the phenomenon when Lagrange came to the rescue. He showed that, owing to the configurations of the spheroids, the shorter axes of their ellipses are subject to variation in length, the longer axes being permanent, and that this variation is continuous and vibratory so that every orbit is in a state of transition, either from circle to ellipse, or from ellipse to circle. In the case of the moon, where the shorter axis is decreasing, the orbit is passing from circle to ellipse, and, consequently, is decreasing too. But after a long series of ages, the ultimate eccentricity will be attained, then the shorter axis will proceed to increase, until the orbit becomes a circle when the process of shortening will again take place, and so on forever. In the case of the Earth, the orbit is passing from ellipse to circle. The facts thus demonstrated do away, of course, with all necessity for supposing an ether, and with all apprehension of the system's instability, on the ether's account. It will be remembered that I have myself assumed what we may term an ether, I have spoken of a subtle influence which we know to be ever in attendance upon matter, although becoming manifest only through matter's heterogeneity. To this influence, without daring to touch it at all in any effort at explaining its awful nature, I have referred the various phenomena of electricity, heat, light, magnetism, and more, of vitality, consciousness, and thought, in a word, of spirituality. It will be seen at once, then, that the ether thus conceived is radically distinct from the ether of the astronomers, inasmuch as theirs is matter, and mine is not. With the idea of a material ether seems thus to have departed altogether the thought of that universal agglomeration so long predetermined by the poetical fancy of mankind an agglomeration in which a sound philosophy might have been warranted in putting faith at least to a certain extent, if for no other reason than that by this poetical fancy it had been so predetermined. But so far as astronomy, so far as mere physics have yet spoken, the cycles of the universe are perpetual. The universe has no conceivable end. Had an end been demonstrated, however, from so purely collateral a cause as an ether, man's instinct of the divine capacity to adapt would have rebelled against the demonstration. We should have been forced to regard the universe with some such sense of dissatisfaction as we experience in contemplating an unnecessarily complex work of human art. Creation would have affected us as an imperfect plot in a romance, where the denouement is awkwardly brought about by interposed incidents external and foreign to the main subject, instead of springing out of the bosom of the thesis out of the heart of the ruling idea, instead of arising as a result of the primary proposition, as inseparable and inevitable part and parcel of the fundamental conception of the book. What I mean by the symmetry of mere surface will now be more clearly understood. It is simply by the blandishment of this symmetry that we have been beguiled into the general idea of which Maedler's hypothesis is but a part the idea of the vorticial indrawing of the orbs. Dismissing this nakedly physical conception, the symmetry of the principle sees the end of all things metaphysically involved in the thought of a beginning, seeks and finds in this origin of all things the rudiment of this end, and perceives the impiety of supposing this end likely to be brought about less simply, less directly, less obviously, less artistically, than through the reaction of the originating act. Recurring, then, to a previous suggestion, let us understand the systems, let us understand each star, with its attendant planets, as 
but a titanic atom existing in space with precisely the same inclination for unity which characterized in the beginning the actual atoms after their irradiation throughout the universal sphere as these original atoms rush towards each other in generally straight lines so let us conceive as at least generally rectilinear the paths of the system atoms towards their respective centers of aggregation and in this direct drawing together of the systems into clusters with a similar and simultaneous drawing together of the clusters themselves while undergoing consolidation we have at length attained the great now the awful present the existing condition of the universe of the still more awful future a not irrational analogy may guide us in framing a hypothesis the equilibrium between the centripetal and centrifugal forces of each system being necessarily destroyed upon attainment of a certain proximity to the nucleus of the cluster to which it belongs there must occur at once a chaotic or seemingly chaotic precipitation of the moons upon the planets of the planets upon the suns and of the suns upon the nuclei and the general result of this precipitation must be the gathering of the myriad now existing stars of the firmament into an almost infinitely less number of almost infinitely superior spheres in being immeasurably fewer the worlds of that day will be immeasurably greater than our own then indeed amid unfathomable abysses will be glaring unimaginable suns but all this will be merely a climactic magnificence foreboding the great end of this end the new genesis described can be but a very partial postponement while undergoing consolidation the clusters themselves with a speed prodigiously accumulative have been rushing towards their own general centre and now with a thousandfold electric velocity commensurate only with their material grandeur and with the spiritual passion of their appetite for oneness the majestic remnants of the tribe of stars flash at length into a common embrace the inevitable catastrophe is at hand but this catastrophe what is it we have seen accomplished the ingathering of the orbs henceforward are we not to understand one material globe of globes as constituting and comprehending the universe such a fancy would be altogether at war with every assumption and consideration of this discourse i have already alluded to that absolute reciprocity of adaptation which is the idiosyncrasy of the divine art stamping it divine up to this point of our reflections we have been regarding the electrical influence as something by dint of whose repulsion alone matter is enabled to exist in that state of diffusion demanded for the fulfillment of its purposes so far in a word we have been considering the influence in question as ordained for matter's sake to subverse the objects of matter with a perfectly legitimate reciprocity we are now permitted to look at matter as created solely for the sake of this influence solely to serve the objects of this spiritual ether through the aid by the means through the agency of matter and by dint of its heterogeneity is this ether manifested is spirit individualized it is merely in the development of this ether through heterogeneity that particular masses of matter become animate sensitive and in the ratio of their heterogeneity some reaching a degree of sensitiveness involved in what we call thought and thus attaining conscious intelligence in this view we are enabled to perceive matter as a means not as an end its purposes are thus seen to have been comprehended in its diffusion and with the return into unity these purposes cease the absolutely consolidated globe of globes would be objectless therefore not for a moment could it continue to exist matter created for an end would unquestionably on fulfillment of that end be matter no longer let us endeavor to understand that it would disappear and that god would remain all in all that every work of divine conception must coexist and coexpire with its particular design seems to me especially obvious 
and I make no doubt that, on perceiving the final globe of globes to be objectless, the majority of my readers will be satisfied with my therefore it cannot continue to exist. Nevertheless, as the startling thought of its instantaneous disappearance is one which the most powerful intellect cannot be expected readily to entertain on grounds so decidedly abstract, let us endeavor to look at the idea from some other and more ordinary point of view. Let us see how thoroughly and beautifully it is corroborated in an a posteriori consideration of matter as we actually find it. I have before said that the attraction and repulsion being undeniably the sole properties by which matter is manifested to mind, we are justified in assuming that matter exists only as attraction and repulsion. In other words, that attraction and repulsion are matter. There being no conceivable case in which we may not employ the term matter and the terms attraction and repulsion taken together as equivalent and therefore convertible expressions in logic. Now, the very definition of attraction implies particularity, the existence of parts, particles, or atoms, for we define it as the tendency of each atom, etc., to every other atom, etc., according to a certain law. Of course, where there are no parts, where there is absolute unity, where the tendency to oneness is satisfied, there can be no attraction. This has been fully shown, and all philosophy admits it. When on fulfillment of its purposes, then, matter shall have returned into its original condition of one, a condition which presupposes the expulsion of the separative ether whose province and whose capacity are limited to keeping the atoms apart until that great day when, this ether being no longer needed, the overwhelming pressure of the finally collective attraction shall at length just sufficiently predominate and expel it. When I say, matter, finally expelling the ether, shall have returned into absolute unity, it will then, to speak paradoxically for the moment, be matter without attraction and without repulsion. In other words, matter without matter. In other words, again, matter no more. In sinking into unity, it will sink at once into that nothingness which, to all finite perception, unity must be, into that material nihility from which alone we can conceive it to have been evoked, to have been created by the volition of God. I repeat, then, let us endeavor to comprehend that the final globe of globes will instantaneously disappear, and that God will remain all in all. But are we here to pause? Not so. On the universal agglomeration and dissolution, we can readily conceive that a new and perhaps totally different series of conditions may ensue, another creation and irradiation returning into itself, another action and reaction of the divine will, guiding our imaginations by that omniprevalent law of laws, the law of periodicity, are we not, indeed, more than justified in entertaining a belief, let us say, rather, in indulging a hope, that the processes we have here ventured to contemplate will be renewed forever, and forever, and forever, a novel universe swelling into existence, and then subsiding into nothingness, at every throb of the heart divine. And now, this heart divine, what is it? It is our own. Let not the merely seeming irreverence of this idea frighten our souls from that cool exercise of consciousness, from that deep tranquillity of self-inspection, through which alone we can hope to attain the presence of this, the most sublime of truths, and look it leisurely in the face. The phenomena on which our conclusions must at this point depend are merely spiritual shadows, but not the less thoroughly substantial. We walk about amid the destinies of our world existence, encompassed by dim but ever-present memories of a destiny more vast, very distant in the bygone time, and infinitely awful. We live out a youth particularly haunted by such dreams, yet never mistaking them for dreams. As memories, we know them. During our youth, the distinction is too clear to deceive us even for a moment. 
so long as this youth endures the feeling that we exist is the most natural of all feelings we understand it thoroughly that there was a period at which we did not exist or that it might so have happened that we never had existed at all are the considerations indeed which during this youth we find difficulty in understanding why we should not exist is up to the epoch of our manhood of all queries the most unanswerable existence self-existence existence from all time and to all eternity seems up to the epoch of manhood a normal and unquestionable condition seems because it is but now comes the period at which a conventional world reason awakens us from the truth of our dream doubt surprise and incomprehensibility arrive at the same moment they say you live and the time was when you lived not you have been created an intelligence exists greater than your own and it is only through this intelligence you live at all these things we struggle to comprehend and cannot cannot because these things being untrue are thus of necessity incomprehensible no thinking being lives who at some luminous point of his life of thought has not felt himself lost amid the surges of futile efforts at understanding or believing that anything exists greater than his own soul the utter impossibility of any one soul feeling itself inferior to another the intense overwhelming dissatisfaction and rebellion at the thought these with the omniprevalent aspirations at perfection are but the spiritual coincident with the material struggles towards the original unity are to my mind at least a species of proof far surpassing what man terms demonstration that no one soul is inferior to another that nothing is or can be superior to any one soul that each soul is in part its own god its own creator in a word that god the material and spiritual god now exists solely in the diffused matter and spirit of the universe and that the regathering of this diffused matter and spirit will be but the reconstitution of the purely spiritual and individual god in this view and in this view alone we comprehend the riddles of divine injustice of inexorable fate in this view alone the existence of evil becomes intelligible but in this view it becomes more it becomes endurable our souls no longer rebel at a sorrow which we ourselves have imposed upon ourselves in furtherance of our own purposes with a view if even with a futile view to the extension of our own joy i have spoken of memories that haunt us during our youth they sometimes pursue us even in our manhood assume gradually less and less indefinite shapes now and then speak to us with low voices saying there was an epoch in the night of time when a still existent being existed one of the absolutely infinite number of similar beings that people the absolutely infinite domains of the absolutely infinite space it was not and is not in the power of these beings any more than it is in your own to extend by actual increase the joy of his existence but just as it is in your power to expand or to concentrate your pleasures the absolute amount of happiness remaining always the same so did and does a similar capacity appertain to this divine being who thus passes his eternity in perpetual variation of concentrated self and almost infinite self-diffusion what you call the universe is but his present expansive existence he now feels his life through an infinity of imperfect pleasures the partial and pain intertangled pleasures of those inconceivably numerous things which you designate as his creatures but which are really but infinite individualizations of himself all these creatures all those which you term animate as well as those to whom you deny life for no better reason than that you do not behold it in operation all these creatures have in a greater or less degree a capacity for pleasure and for pain 
but the general sum of their sensations is precisely that amount of happiness which appertains by right to the divine being when concentrated within himself these creatures are all too more or less conscious intelligences conscious first of a proper identity conscious secondly and by faint indeterminate glimpses of an identity with the divine being of whom we speak of an identity with god of these two classes of consciousnesses fancy that the former will grow weaker the latter stronger during the long succession of ages which must elapse before these myriads of individual intelligences become blended when the bright stars become blended into one think that the sense of individual identity will be gradually merged in the general consciousness that man for example ceasing imperceptibly to feel himself man will at length attain that awfully triumphant epoch when he shall recognize his existence as that of jehovah in the meantime bear in mind that all is life 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 within life the less within the greater and all within the spirit divine the end end of section nine recording by scotty end of eureka a prose poem by edgar allan poe